In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. The first words of the Bible. Clearly not a scientific statement and never intended as one. But as a symbolic statement, it's not so far wrong because the appearance of civilized man does seem to have taken place with the suddenness of a sunrise. The evolution of this figure, whom we know from skulls, with low forehead and crunching jaws, who came out of his cave to hunt and eat, into this man, living in a shining hall with geometrical proportions and recording the passage of time in beautiful hieroglyphics, this process, which by evolutionary standards should have taken millions of years, seems to have taken only a few hundred. Where did it happen? Historians give contradictory answers, as one archaeological discovery cancels out the other. But from ancient times, people have believed that it happened in Egypt. When did it happen? There we can give a clearer answer, because most people believe that civilization first appeared about 5,000 years ago, both in the Nile Valley and in Mesopotamia. The cities of Mesopotamia rose and fell, but Egypt remained a social unit for almost 3,000 years. How did it happen? Well, I've come out here to describe some of the stages in this almost incredible event what happened in the beginning. We find the answer in the earliest Egyptian art. From about the year 2800 BC, it reveals nearly all the qualities that we value in civilization. A sense of beauty and of the dignity of man. A well-organized government run by responsible men. A belief that man could be inspired by the gods. An awareness of nature as something very close to ourselves, which could be beautiful as well as useful. A sense of clarity and order. Geometry and its application to design in sculpture and architecture. All these qualities appear in Egypt a thousand years before they appear anywhere else. What made possible this miraculous development? Well, for once, the answer is simple. The river Nile. The country has virtually no rainfall. The greater part is desert. But the heavy rains in distant Ethiopia caused the Nile to flood every summer. In the autumn, the floods receded and the land, flooded with absolute regularity, was extremely fertile. It and it alone supported life. It was Egypt. All around stretched the barren desert. Pouring northwards over the cataracts of the Nubian hills, the Nile floods brought with them silt, a rich deposit of fresh earth which was left behind every year when the floods went down. The Greek historian Herodotus rightly said, Egypt was the gift of the Nile. Very early, the Egyptians learned how to profit from this unique situation. They lived mainly on the desert shelf and came down to collect water. They built canals, dug wells, constructed water wheels, cultivated and herded. Oh, 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 oh,
Living in a climate of almost unvarying good weather, dependent on a regular and, as they supposed, God-given natural event, they became adept at its conservation and, in consequence, intensely conservative. The Nile ran from south to north, so that the sun made a complete arc over it. The sun rose in the east, and it was on the east bank that they built their cities. It died in the west, and it was on the west bank that they buried their dead. Light, the sun, water, were life. Darkness and the desert were death. They worshipped the sun under various titles. They thought that it died every night and was reborn. They believed in the immortality of the soul and the resurrection of the body. They believed that good deeds would be rewarded in afterlife. What a deep fall of the human mind from the days of voodoo and human sacrifice. Politically, the crucial step was taken in about 3000 BC. The separate Stone Age communities along the Nile were welded together by a warlike king. Now the narrow strip of Upper Egypt and the wider fertile belt of Lower Egypt, the Delta, would work together. The benefits were immediate. The king who achieved this is thought to have been called Narber. Here he is on a pallet, a sort of plate for offerings to the gods. Below him, the uniting of the two kingdoms of Upper and Lower Egypt, the cooperation on which all the future prosperity of Egypt depended, is symbolized by the intersecting necks of these two monsters. This side is still rather voodooish, but the other side, depicting King Narmer, is clear and orderly, and already shows some of the characteristics of Egyptian art, especially the way in which the heads are turned in profile and the chests are frontal. Fifteen hundred years later, the Egyptians were still commemorating the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt, even as far south as Abu Simbel. The figures representing the two regions are binding together the lungs, the organs vital for life. And rightly so. Whenever the unity was threatened by the breakdown of central government, Egypt suffered. No transport, no building, no productive human life was possible without the Nile. And it has remained the centre of life for the Egyptian peasant. In so far as civilization is the triumph of stability over vicissitude, of order over chaos, and of confidence in renewal, the Nile was the perfect setting for its birth. Soon after 3000 BC, a new capital was established near the junction of Upper and Lower Egypt. We refer to it by its Greek name, Memphis. Well, Memphis was repeatedly sacked and destroyed. Nothing to be seen now but palm trees. But a few miles away, on the first shelf of the desert, a king named Zosair built a royal retreat. Half temple, half a place for peaceful rites and pleasure. And in the middle of it, he built as his tomb the earliest pyramid. This is Saqqara. To my mind, one of the sacred places of the world, the real birthplace of civilization. First thing that strikes one about Saqqara is its lightness and clarity. 
It's built of an exquisite creamy golden limestone. It's the earliest stone building in the world. The cutting is of such perfection, never equaled in Greece or Rome. And the strange thing is that it's an imitation in stone of wooden architecture, even down to imitating in stone the ends of wooden beams. They wanted to make something permanent. This is the entrance, but the whole area of the sacred enclosure is surrounded by a wall in the same style, made of the same beautifully dressed and fitted stone. The love of perfection could not go further. Of course, there have been restorations, and to see what the original building was like, one must look at some sarcophagi of the same date, which reproduce ideal architecture. What a refined, sophisticated style very far from our idea of what ruins or primitive architecture should be, very far from Stonehenge, which was built considerably later. One can say that this row of pillars through which I'm walking is based on clusters of stems, but at the other end of the courtyard they turn into fluted columns, Doric columns, 2,000 years earlier than the Parthenon except that they haven't disengaged themselves from the wall. Even the details that anticipate what we think of as an Egyptian style have a refinement that we might call classical. The oddest buildings of all are those that run along the north side of the court in which sacred festivals were held. What can they have been for? Were they little chapels? They're difficult to enter, and when one gets inside, there's a blank wall. But they have fluted columns of the utmost elegance, which lead up to capitals with holes for flagstaffs. One is completely baffled by the extreme sophistication and the incalculable purpose of this exquisite architecture. Combination of measuring mind and responsive hand cannot go further. The date, 2770 BC. Only a little of the precious outer covering of hewn stone remains on the pyramid, and the inner cause crumbled, so that it does look more barbaric. It's the earliest pyramid. Before that time, men had been buried in relatively modest tombs. And why King Zosa wanted to raise a pyramid of solid stone, we simply don't know. Deep underground in a tunnel nearby, there is a relief of King Zosa running a ritual race. A pose that was to survive all the way through Egyptian art for 3,000 years. Only it was more usually associated with victory than with religious ecstasy. In prehistoric times, kings had run an annual course to prove their continuing energy to rule, and uh, this test may have survived as a ceremony. It has a glorious energy and elasticity. These people had a long run ahead of them. So Zosa's body must have been in the tomb, which has been robbed, like every other royal tomb but one, but his likeness has come down to us in this little stone box. Battered, but grandiose. The man who dominates Saqqara is not King Zosar, but a mysterious, haunting character named Imhotep. According to Egyptian legend, he was a sort of Prometheus, the first student of medicine, the first student of geometry, the first architect. Well, a fairly evolved architecture of brick and wattle did exist before his time. We can still see what it must have been like in contemporary dwellings very close to here. But Imhotep may have been, no, must have been, the first man to build in stone. No doubt he was a pioneer, and a universal man of almost legendary stature, a sort of Egyptian Leonardo da Vinci. He was buried at Saqqara, and recent excavators have found some posthumous likenesses of him. It's just conceivable that they may find his tomb. It should then become a place of pilgrimage
for the whole civilized human race. It's in other tombs around Saqqara that almost all the finest works of art of the Old Kingdom have been found. These tombs were built to commemorate noblemen who were usually shown as a statue in a false entrance inside. And on the surrounding walls are scenes depicting human activity in a way that we hardly find again to the 15th century books of ours or even Bruegel. As in a medieval calendar of the months, we can follow the seasons of the farmer's year. Asses tread in the seed. It was the standard method of sowing in the rich, damp soil of the delta. Harvesting. The scythes would have been stone blades. We're still in the Stone Age. The crop is loaded into rope baskets. The Nile had made Egypt the greatest wheat-producing country of the ancient world. The other source of natural wealth was gold. It was mined in the eastern desert and was one of the first metals to be worked. Here are artisans blowing down hollow reeds to keep the charcoal furnace at the right temperature for smelting the gold. The craftsmen who worked on the gold collars and jeweled headdresses were chosen for their grotesque size, either very tall or dwarfish, so that if they tried to steal or run away, they could easily be identified. These reliefs are also full of vitality. On a Nile boat, the boatmen were obviously as rowdy as Thames barges. With what energy and zest the artist has portrayed this local brawl. In addition to their extraordinary record of human activity, these tombs also show us something very important about the early Egyptians, their love of animals and of nature generally. They show all the stages of animal husbandry. A bearded farmer helps in the birth of a calf. Cattle are driven across the river, while the herders keep an anxious lookout for lurking crocodiles. <laughs> Among the tall reeds of the swamps, a small boy fishes, oblivious of the drama of the hippopotamus hunt at the other end of the boat. historian Herodotus, when he visited Egypt long after its days of imperial greatness, in fact in about the year 450 BC, was amazed at the Egyptian feeling for animals. They didn't seem to think of them as a separate species to men. Very shocking to a Greek. And he tells how, when the house is on fire, the first thing the Egyptians do is to save the cats. They hand them from one person to another while the house burns down. 
in all this there may be some element of totemism but totemism alone doesn't account for their amazing curiosity about different kinds of birds and fishes there are said to be 18 kinds of bird and 15 kinds of fishes represented in the tomb of T nor does it explain the delicate sympathy with which every species is observed from these reliefs we know more about life in ancient Egypt than we do about any other early society because the Egyptians were from the first a profoundly visual people In Egypt, one is tempted to paraphrase the opening words of St. John's Gospel and say, in the beginning was the image, and the image was with God, and the image was God. Even their writing consisted in a series of visual experiences, pictograms that turned into letters, consonants only, there were no vowels. These beautiful little images must be the most uneconomical form of writing ever invented even more so than the Chinese ideogram and sooner or later they were superseded by two simpler forms of script very early they came to be recorded on another Egyptian invention papyrus the papyrus plant grew all along the Nile in ancient times its tough stems are often ten feet in height the Egyptians cut them into strips like this, soaked them, dried them, and simply pressed them together in a crisscross pattern. No other adhesive was used. One can see the crisscrossing of the strips if one holds up a piece of papyrus to the light. There it is. The result was an extremely tough and durable form of writing material. Much of it has survived. Here's an example. Papyrus was used all over the Mediterranean world for more than 2,000 years until the Chinese invention of paper superseded it. The Egyptians continued to use the carved hieroglyphs for all ceremonial inscriptions. And, like Chinese calligraphy, they are a beautiful form of decoration only unlike Chinese calligraphy they are always the same and they don't allow for individual expression because their script consisted of stereotyped images the Egyptians could not achieve verbal abstraction so they never created a philosophy in the Greek sense of the word they could not speculate on the meaning of words but one can't say that they were unable to form concepts because all their visual experience was subjected to strict underlying form and geometrical schemes. pyramids. They've got Egypt a bad name. You remember pictures in the children's encyclopedia of hundreds of slaves pulling huge blocks under the lash of a brier. It is possibly true, as Herodotus counts, that the Great Pyramid demanded the labor of a hundred thousand men for twenty years. But the blocks floated up to the site during the flooding of the Nile, and these men were not slaves or prisoners. We even know what they were paid. The whole exercise may well have been undertaken in an almost devotional spirit, like building a great medieval cathedral, a monument to their god-king. According to Petrie, some of the masonry so fine 
The blocks weighing many tons are set together with seams showing a joint of one thousandth of an inch, equal to optician's work of the present day, but on a scale of acres instead of inches of material. The blocks were cut by bronze saws with diamond edges, and the Great Pyramid consists of 2,300,000 blocks. Napoleon, when he saw it, calculated that with the stones of the three pyramids, he could build a wall ten feet high and a foot wide all round France. For nearly 4,000 years, until the 19th century, the Great Pyramid was the tallest building in the world. Well, in the end, it does seem somewhat unimaginative to devote so much labor to mere size. They look like brutal assertions of power until one sees them. Then one realizes that these vast exhibitions of solid geometry were perhaps the only things that could hold their own at the junction of cultivated Egypt and the annihilating desert that stretches interminably to the west. I don't suppose that its builder, Kafor, commonly known as Cheops, thought of it in that light. He thought of it partly as an assertion of power and partly as a safe resting place for his body, which unfortunately it was not because Egyptian tomb robbers had more time and quite as much expertise as modern safe breakers. And he also thought of it as did his subjects, as an indestructible assertion of faith. And this it has proved to be. The pyramids, which the poet Blake thought of as the essence of materialism, are in their way religious buildings. Religious also is that other familiar image that crouches in front of them, the Sphinx. For centuries, it was hidden under the sand. And it isn't even mentioned by the Greek historian Herodotus. When it was discovered by Napoleon's expedition, it was restored and the nose fell off. The nose is in the British Museum. Subsequent restorations have made things worse. It's a god and not a pharaoh but which God we do not know. The sculpture of 2500 BC shows the same confidence and energy that went to build the pyramids. When I look at small children hopping and bouncing, I think that's got to last them 70 years. The energy of the old kingdom lasted 700. In this group, the pharaoh Mykerinus is accompanied by two female figures, a goddess named Hathor and the embodiment of a province called a gnome, who was important because the administration of Egypt depended very much on regional government. In fact, regional autonomy was the cause of the coast of the Old Kingdom. Another group by the sculptor shows Mykerinus and his wife. See, she is treated as his equal. The days when wives of the pharaohs were tiny figures at their feet are a thousand years away. <laughs> 